the days when the educated people of the world believed the Bible, they had a time scale to work with. From the genealogies of the Bible, it was easy to see that creation happened not much more than 6,000 years ago. A few literary conventions would make the time scale a little bit longer, but not much. Charles Lyell made it possible to manufacture a different time scale by giving his uniformity principle the status of a law of science. That piece of lawyer's cunning claims that what happened in the past, as far as it's possible to look back, is exactly what we see happening today. With this claim, he was able to push time back to 600 million years. Geologists love those millions of years, but they soon came to realise that Lyle's story is untenable. There's too much evidence in the rock record for catastrophes. They pretend that they no longer use Lyle's reasoning to get those millions of years. They say they rely on radiometric dating. But radiometric dating is calibrated against Lyle's timescale, and they have no basis to manufacture any other timescale which they could calibrate it against. There's an enormous difference between the Bible's timescale and Lyle's. That difference is the flood. Lyle's story denies the flood and explains all the sediments deposited in water as being laid down uniformly at three millimetres every century. The Bible's time scale explains the vast majority of sediments as being laid down in one year during a catastrophic flood. George Dodwell's graph, the plot of axis tilt measurements from various parts of the world over the past 4,000 years, provides an independent indication of the real time scale. Both secular scientists and Dodwell deduced that the Earth's axis was originally almost vertical. Both accept that the Earth's axis was disturbed and tilted to about 26 degrees. Both accept that it was probably struck by a body about 200 kilometres in diameter. But secular scientists say it must have happened about 4 billion years ago since there's no sign of it in the record of the rocks. The curve of observations shows that the impact happened about four and a half thousand years ago, and the sediments of the geological column are the record of it. Let's look at some observations and see which of these two stories could possibly explain them. In part 29, Professor Anthony Brink admitted that angiosperms are often found in the Ordovician, and sometimes in the Cambrian. On Lyell's time scale, angiosperms evolved in the Cretaceous about 100 million years ago. The Ordovician is 425 to 500 million years ago, and the Cambrian 500 to 600 million. There's no chance of finding angiosperms half a billion years before they even evolved. Score zero for Lyell. With the angiosperms alive at the same time as the Ordovician and Cambrian index creatures, sediment carried by huge waves could certainly have buried them together. Score one for Dodwell. The tree trunks in sediment, as we saw at St Etienne in France, standing upright through layer after layer. That's not possible if the sediment was laid down at three millimetres a century. Another zero for Lyle. But certainly possible with Dodwell's scenario. Another one to his score. In part 22, we met Mary Schweitzer's Tyrannosaurus remains, still containing flexible blood vessels, still containing blood cells, they were extinct 65 million years ago, according to Lyle's timescale. Most of the patents for genetic engineering are for ways to slow down the decay of biological material after death. Even using the best patent methods, blood 
can't last anything like a million years, never mind 65 million. Another zero for Lyle. Four and a half thousand years could just be possible, so score one more for Dodwell. A few years ago, a Japanese fishing vessel pulled a large carcass out of the ocean. The crew of the ship were convinced this was a plesiosaur. It certainly looks like a plesiosaur. Their holds were full of fish and they didn't want to contaminate their catch, so they cut off some of the flesh, took some photos and dropped the rest back in the sea. They took the flesh and the photos to Tokyo University. The experts there said it was a plesiosaur. The Japanese were so confident they issued a plesiosaur post-it stamp. The scientific establishment claimed this must have been a basking shark. The Tokyo University staff said the DNA was not from a fish. And it certainly looks like a plesiosaur, with a head on the end of a long neck, large flippers, not what one would expect of a shark. But the establishment had to claim it was a shark, otherwise they would have to admit Lyle's time scale was wrong. Lyle's time scale is the best in the field and is therefore sacrosanct. Lyle's story says plesiosaurs became extinct more than 60 million years ago. Sea creatures like plesiosaurs could have survived the enormous flood caused by a meteorite impact. Several sightings have been claimed recently around Canada, and the biologist at Tokyo was so convinced it was a plesiosaur that the Japanese authorities issued that stamp. This isn't compatible with Lyle's timescale, but it is compatible with Dodwell's. The Colorado River just upstream of the Grand Canyon has deeply cut meanders. So has the River San Jose. Experiments have been done to see how meanders form. Meanders only cut downwards if the riverbed is soft. When a river reaches rock, it cuts sideways and wipes out the meander. So all those hundreds of metres of sediment must have been fresh and soft when the meanders cut through them. Fits with rapid deposition after Dodwell's impact. Doesn't fit with Lyle's three millimetres a century. And then we have creatures which disappear from Lyle's geological column becoming extinct. Solandon disappears about 35 million years ago. Tuatara about 130 million years ago. Both were extinct long ago. But they've both been found alive today. There are many other creatures extinct according to the geological column, but alive and well in the Lebendigen Vorwelt Museum in Hagen Hohen Limburg in Germany. So zero for Lyle again, but this could be a problem for Dodwell too. That impact would have raised waves moving at more than 750 kilometres an hour, and much higher than the three miles calculated by Arndt and O'Keefe for the 10 kilometre meteorite we saw in part 30. Those waves would have engulfed the entire Earth in even less time than Arndt and O'Keefe's 27 hours. How could any land-dwelling, air-breathing creature like Solondon or Tuatara have survived? Well, if we look at the Bible's timescale, we see Noah's flood happening about four and a half thousand years ago, and that's the time of impact from Dodwell's curve of ancient observations. So they could have survived with the other guests on Noah's Ark, and that leaves Dodwell with a full score against Lyle Zero. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.